Let's look at that bone fusion. This is a chicken. A chicken has approximately 120 bones compared to our 207. So lots of bone fusion. And uh, one place to see it is there in the hand. All those many bones that make up our hand uh, pretty much are reduced to sort of three fingers or two fingers in a bird. Yes, it is true that most birds have only two fingers in their wings and most of them have lost their claws. You see, rather than any definition of biblical kinds, every species of every genus within every family of birds that we still have today fall into one of two ancestral or parent clades. Neonates, meaning new birds, as most of them are, or paleonates, meaning the more ancient and primitive birds. And these include the large flightless birds like ostriches and emus, as well as a few even larger varieties that people have driven to extinction. Ostrich fingers are still adorned with claws. While you can readily see two clawed fingers, if you remove the flesh, you'll see they have three fingers with claws, just like most other theropod dinosaurs. Except for Tyrannosaurus, of course, who had only two fingers, just like most birds still do today. Most birds except for the emu. You see, emus don't have wings. They just have little spindly arms like a T-Rex did, ending in a single finger. And just like the non-avian dinosaur Mononychus, the end of that finger is in a claw. What's interesting about that is that the arms of emus never develop musculature, so they can't move. What's the point of having a sickle claw in an arm that can't move? That's not a very intelligent design, and it obviously wasn't deliberately designed to be that way. That claw, and indeed the whole arm, are just a vestige of the more, dis the more developed arms and claws that emus and ostriches and all other birds and their ancient ancestors used to have and used to use. This is important because Darwin realized that the feet of some birds were exactly identical to the feet of theropod dinosaurs, but that their wing fingers were fused together. So he predicted that if birds had evolved from dinosaurs, then we would expect to find a fossil bird with unfused wing fingers. And the first of many such birds was found just a couple of years later, while Darwin was still alive, to see his theory vindicated by the fossil evidence. Evolution provides the only explanation for why so many fossil birds still have three fully functioning grasping fingers in their wings, just like most other theropod dinosaurs. And similarly, evolution provides the only explanation for bone fusion. If birds were just magically created unrelated to anything else, there wouldn't be any bone fusion. They would have their own unique original structure right from the beginning. But embryological development often follows the patterns established by evolutionary development, where ancestral features appear in embryo but are later reabsorbed into as the animal matures. Examples include uh, legs on the fetuses of legless lizards or hind leg buds on whales and uh, bird fetuses initially have three fingers in their arms and, and they can even develop teeth. And clearly those teeth were not there uh, by design. Their unintended incidental design eventually eliminated those features in favor of newly developing ones. Uh, most of the primary flight feathers are attached to the hand here. The secondaries are attached to the ulna on the arm. And uh, there's one finger basically like a thumb in the front part of the hand, and there are feathers attached to that. That's called the alula. And when that thumb moves forward, it creates a slot between the rest of the wing. And that slot's just like the slot you see on the wing of an airplane when it lands. It opens a slot in the front. Or you look at a sailboat, you see the jib and the mainsail. There's a slot that allows the air to come through. Uh, that increases the speed of the sailboat or reduces the stalling speed of an aircraft. So uh, birds using the same principles or using an aircraft. That's because birds are aircraft. So they've had to adapt existing features in order to perform the functions necessary for flight. Same as some shrew-like mammals did when they became bats. Same as basal ornithodirids did when they became pterosaurs. But it didn't happen all at once for any of them. All these groups had to work out for themselves how to fly, just as we did when we invented airplanes, because there was no divine guidance telling anyone how any of this worked. So we had to practice and run a lot of trial and error experiments to work that out for ourselves. 
so did birds. And the earliest birds, by which I mean Archaeopteryx, Rahonavis, Jehalornis, Arornis, and Anchiornis, as well as other unambiguously true birds like Confucius Ornis and Chongmingia, beginning with Fukuipteryx, a Cretaceous bird, and the earliest one with a pygostyle or a nub tail. None of these evidently possessed a lula, and that means they couldn't take off without a runway or a jump off point, and they couldn't pluck their food off the ground in flight. For some time, the earliest bird known to have this feature was Eo alula avis, whose name means dawn of the alula birds. Although since its discovery, there, there are some other earlier birds have been known to found this feature, like Iberomasaurus, uh, and uh, the shortened fingers of Sapiornis imply that it might have had that feature too. If they had been deliberately designed by an infallible god who knew what he was doing right from the beginning, then all of these birds would have had advanced aeronautics and not just one lineage of birds to arise later on. Uh, let's look at some of the other uh, bones. The arm or the wing of the bird, apart from the hand, looks pretty standard. We have a radius and an ulna there, just like we have the two bones in our arm. And then we have the humerus. And the interesting thing is the secondary feathers are only on the ulna from wrist to uh, uh, the, the secondary flight feathers, from wrist to elbow. There are no feathers attached to the humerus. Uh, they're in the skin, but not attached to bone. The same is true of Manoraptor and dinosaurs. Here's the ulna of a turkey vulture, showing how the secondary feather quills anchor into the bone, which gives it the necessary strength for flight. And when you remove the feathers and clean off the blood, you can see the indentations where the feathers have made their mark in the bone. But this fossil ulna shows that velociraptors too had the same indentations. Velociraptors, oviraptors, troodontids, therizinosaurus, and the like were not birds, and they did not fly. For many years, creationist pseudoscientists used to argue that evolution was impossible because there was no gradual sequence of steps that could turn an arm into a wing because one of the intermediate stages would effectively have to be a half wing. And science deniers say there's no possible use for a half a wing. But like every other argument they've ever made, this one too is wrong as most Manoraptor and dinosaurs did in fact have half-sized wings, and they were apparently used in a number of ways. As sexual displays used in, in courtship dances or in defense displays, bluffing and puffing up. And most importantly, as this fossil oviraptor shows, dinosaurs sat on their eggs the same way birds do today, and they used these half-sized wings to better insulate a larger clutch of eggs, which provides a pretty strong selective pressure for how wings developed. Then, once you've got that much, strong wings could be used not only for you know, blowing away uh, debris and such, but a half wing could be used as a powered assist in climbing or running uphill, where most other animals, whether larger predators or smaller prey, couldn't go uphill as fast as downhill. So it turns out there's quite a lot of value, even in an arm that is only half a wing. Evolutionary homology is the only explanation for why a bird's wing is made out of a dinosaur's arm instead of some new and original design or creation. Every vertebrate capable of powered flight adapted their arms into wings using the same radius, ulna, and humerus bones they share with dinosaurs and indeed with the standard for all tetrapods in general. The front limbs of all tetrapods are made of the same bones, whether it's the leg of a horse or the flipper of a whale. Now, why is that? Evolution from common ancestry provides the only explanation for any of this, and it explains it all. That explanation is obviously correct, where creationism can never accurately or adequately explain anything ever and can only make up nonsense excuses to pretend as if this isn't even a fact that need be explained. Meaning that the very people who argue that there is no such thing as a coincidence are trying to dismiss homology on the excuse that it is just a coincidence and that we should ignore everything that this implies. Uh, then we look at the ribs and we see there's little struts that kind of hold the ribs together and birds have very little movement of the ribs. That's why there's very little muscle between the ribs of a bird. If you've ever eaten chicken ribs, they're no bargain, I can tell you that. So uh, halfway down the rib, there's a hinge in, in bird ribs. And so uh, the ribs are able to move a little bit, the lower part in relationship to the upper part, but the upper part of the ribs where they attach to the vertebrae, uh, there's no movement. 
And so uh, when we breathe, our chest cavity gets bigger and smaller. But with birds, that's not uh, possible, which is one of the interesting differences. It's not a difference at all. It's a trait held in common. They're exactly the same. This characteristic is now considered to be ubiquitous throughout all of theropod dinosaurs, not just manoraptors, but also tyrannosaurs, megalosaurs, allosaurus, carnotaurus, spinosaurus, all of them. This so-called difference between birds and dinosaurs is actually a diagnostic feature of theropod dinosaurs, which necessarily includes birds since they all share this identical commonality. Uh, this is that sin sacrum we were talking about earlier, the fusion of about 20 to 25 bones in the pelvis. Uh, notice right there in that oval window is a keel. And not many creatures have a keel. When you see a keel on, on a skeleton, a, a flat plate like that, it's an attachment for very powerful muscles. And we do indeed have powerful muscles that attach. Chickens don't have anywhere near as powerful a muscles attached there as, say, a, a swift or a, a, a hawk or something like that. Uh, but it does have muscles, and these are the flight muscles that attach to a keel. I hope I don't have to tell you, dinosaurs don't have flight muscles, so dinosaurs don't have a keel either. And neither do many birds. None of the paleonites have a keel, not even the tinamou, which is the only surviving member of that clade that can still fly. And why don't they have a keel? For the same reason the earliest birds didn't have one either. Confucius Sornus Dewey didn't have a keeled sternum, though it may have had the precursor condition, which is a connection of cartilage to which the pectoral muscles or flight muscles can attach to. And then that cartilage can be ossified, you know, to become bone in a later species, like Confucius Sornus Sanctus which had a keel sternum, just a little one, and not as well developed as some other later species did. Uh, finally, look at that neck up there. That, that's <laughs> no bone reduction in the neck. That's one place where the bird shows off a bit. Instead of having, as we mammals do, we all have seven bones in our neck. That's true of a mouse, it's true of a human, and it's true of a giraffe. If you're a mammal, that is if you have hair, mammary glands, you have seven bones in your neck. But birds have lots of bones in their neck, and it gives their neck a lot of flexibility. And as we'll see, that's, that's pretty important for the bird. Dr. Menton admitted that we are mammals, according to derived synapomorphies, diagnostic characteristics that inarguably place us among other animals. But he doesn't seem to understand what that means. It is true that where dinosaurs, including birds, can have a range of cervical vertebrae, Mammals are genetically hardwired to have only seven, and there are very few exceptions to that rule. But he doesn't seem to understand why that is or what that means. And then finally, those wonderful legs on the bird. Uh, you can see from the hip all the way down to the uh, toes. And uh, the uh, whole femur, the part that attaches to the hip, has brought the balance point far enough forward so the bird balances front to back. So instead of, uh, instead of balancing from this spot right here, uh, the way a dinosaur would at the hip, the way we balance at the hip, birds balance at this point down here, the knee. That's unique to birds. I know of no other creature that's quite like that. The purpose of science is to improve our understanding of the perceptible reality that we call nature. Creation, science, doesn't care about that. Instead, their purpose is to make believe things that are not evidently true, and to make you believe things that are evidently not true. Science education seeks to inform and inspire. Religious indoctrination seeks to mislead and deceive. Believers know they can't explain any of these things, and they can't explain them away either, but they don't care preferring to say, let's just ignore all of that as if it doesn't even matter. Or they'll do as Dr. David Menton just did here and lie about it, which is all they can do. They will not admit that they already knew what you now know, but that they hid that from you or misrepresented it deliberately, dishonestly, because that had harsh your buzz and spoil the fantasy, which is the point of the whole thing. If they pull back the curtain, it's all ruined. So they don't want to learn. They want to pretend. The truth is what the facts are. And if you don't care what the facts are, then you don't care what the truth is. And that's just one more reason why there are no 
answers in Genesis.